Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I, as you heard, my name is Dr. Bill Fairfelder, and I'll be your host today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a retired professor of arts and humanities and docent emeritus at the American Museum of Natural History. I currently live in Portland, Oregon, speaking to you from tonight, where I'm a lecturer, writer, and artist. I also return regularly to my hometown of New York City, where I continue to enjoy the many wonders of the Big Apple. Now, because we can't cover everything in one presentation, I invite you to go to my website, makingwings.net, where you could do a deeper dive into today's topic and, and others if you choose. Let me show you. It's going to be deeper dive number 50. So let me hit that. And let's just make sure that the screen is shared. So you'll be brought to the home page when you go to makingwings.net. Go to the hamburger menu in the upper right corner. You're going to see many things here. Please feel free to visit any or all of them. But for tonight, we want to go to deeper dives. You click it on, and it's number 50, the holidays unwrapped. And if you click on that, what you're going to find is some suggestions for reading. And then you're going to be uh, find material uh, about things that we're going to be talking about tonight, the winter solstice, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa. And you're going to find a number of websites about each of those four holidays. And uh, how this works is, um, so for example, if you wanted to get an overview of Hanukkah, if you click on the first one, you'll be brought to a Wikipedia page. When you are done with it, you just click it off and you'll be back on my website and you can continue uh, your studies. So uh, please take advantage of that. Makingwings.net, deeper dive number 50. Now, one of the things that you did see on my website was recommended media. And I suggest the following books as excellent places to start your exploration. Uh, Dorothy Morrison's Yule is a great introduction to the history of pagan celebrations of the winter solstice. Diane Ashton's Hanukkah in America traces the roots of the festival from biblical times to the present, focusing especially on how Jewish Americans created a viable alternative to Christmas celebrations. Stephen Nissenbaum's award-winning The Battle for Christmas traces the long and winding road of Christian nativity celebrations. And finally, Keith May's book, Kwanzaa, is a fascinating study that's subtitled Black Power and the Making of the African-American Holiday Tradition. We'll be talking about these books uh, and actually reading quotes from them as we go along. So, with all of this said, let's begin. And the first of our holidays is a winter festival for most of us, but interestingly enough, a warm weather event in the Southern Hemisphere. Hence, the two different costumery that you see on this slide, uh, winter on the right and uh, very warm and sunny on the left. Now, all of today's holidays starting with the solstice, have at their core the concept of light, the light of the sun, the miraculous light of the temple in Jerusalem, the light of the world in the Christian tradition, and the light of solidarity during Kwanzaa. Now, to get us started, here's a, a quote from Dorothy Morrison's book, Yule. The winter holidays provide us with a time for reflection, resolution, and renewal, a time for gift giving, goodwill, and kindness. Most important, though, 
They provide us with rituals to celebrate the balance of light and dark. Rituals for welcoming the healing powers of warmth back into our world. And that gives us a common ground that draws us together as a people. Now, as we'll see, especially with Hanukkah and Kwanzaa, this road to a uh, quote unquote shared experience or common ground is quite complex. So we'll bookmark that idea and we're gonna move on with the first winter holiday that we're exploring. The celebration of winter solstice is one of the oldest winter celebrations in the world. It's around December 21st in the Northern Hemisphere, but around June 21st in the Southern Hemisphere. But because most of the Earth's land masses and population are in the Northern Hemisphere, the tendency is to think of the solstice as a cold weather event. But remember, winter is June 21st in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, prehistoric humans, uh, that would mean Homo sapiens, Denisovans, and Neanderthals, were hunters and then gatherers. Homo sapiens, us, the last surviving group of hominins, eventually became farmers. Now, all of these early human species acknowledged the importance of the sun. But we have definitive proof that early Homo sapiens, us, definitely reverenced and even worshipped the sun. The winter solstice became a way for prehistoric peoples to live out the hope of Percy Shelley's famous line, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. Now, this is especially important in the far north of the Northern Hemisphere, where it's pitch black for at least a couple of months out of the year. The harvest has been brought in, and now there's hope for a new planting season. Some of the first recorded winter solstice festivals happened about 3000 BCE in Egypt. Uh, there was an extravagant 12 day celebration honoring the rebirth of the sun god Horus. The 12 days represented the 12 months of the Egyptian calendar. Buildings were decorated with greenery, especially palm branches with 12 fronds. Palm branches put out one shoot per month. So the 12 fronded branch formed a representation of the entire birth, death and rebirth of the sun. By 2300 BCE, uh, we get to the Babylonians who celebrated Zagmut, another 12 day festival in which the sun god Marduk battles with monsters to regain his realm. People would pray for Marduk's success on the first five days before the solstice. And when he did achieve victory on the solstice, indicated by the fact that the sun stayed just a minute or two longer the day after, there were parades, there were feasts, and certainly there were gift exchanges. Moving forward, we get to the 600 BCE period and the Persians. Uh, Persian is the modern day Iran. Celebrating uh, the Sakaya is uh, also another 12 day festival. Its focus was the order of the world thrown into chaos and then back into order again. Slaves and masters exchanged places. A mock king was crowned. Law and order flew out the window. Grudges and debts were forgiven, if only temporarily. And by the end of the festival, when the sun was back in control and giving more and more light each day, order was restored. Now, this holiday chaos tradition would become part of festivals elsewhere in the Middle East and eventually in Europe, as we will see. By 480 BCE and moving forward, we come to the Greeks. The Greek solstice depicts the triumph of light as Zeus, 
Zeus defeats Kronos and the Titans and restores order after, you guessed it, 12 days of battle. Now, one interesting aspect of the Greek festival were the dangerous imps called Kalakantsaroi. They roamed the land, often stealing the spirits of unsuspecting children, especially those born during the festival. This is very similar to the imp character of Krampus in Central European cultures. In ancient Greece, new babies were wrapped with garlic bundles, and because imps and monsters supposedly couldn't tolerate fire and smoke, each family kept a large log burning for the duration of the festival. Now, some of these symbolic gestures would reappear much later. Garlic became a way to ward off demons and vampires, and the burning log would find its way into the mythologies and folk tales of Europe. And more of that in a moment. By 250 BCE, the ancient Romans also began holding a festival to celebrate the rebirth of the year. What eventually became known as Saturnalia ran for seven days from the 17th of December to the 24th. Now, as we saw with Persian solstice festivals, it was a time when the ordinary rules were turned upside down, a time of frivolity and debauchery. Men, for example, dressed as women and masters dressed as slaves. The festival also involved decorating houses with greenery, uh, lighting candles, holding pro uh, processions, and giving gifts. Well, by 200 of the common era, we know through art and oral tradition that Norsemen of Northern Europe saw the sun as a wheel that changed the seasons. And it was from the word for wheel, hule, H-O-U-L, that the word yule, Y-U-L-E, is thought to have come. During this winter solstice uh, gathering, the Norsemen lit bonfires, told stories, and drank sweet ale. Now, before we get to the Druids, I'd like to say a quick word about mistletoe. Mistletoe is a small evergreen shrub that is semi-parasitic, living on and off other plants and drawing their nutrients from them. The uh, picture in the upper right of your screen illustrates this relationship. As the illustration on the left shows, the Druids, who were Celtic priests who practiced from around 300 BCE to 200, BC, uh, 200 CE, I should say, uh, would cut the mistletoe that grew on the oak trees and give it as a blessing. Oaks were sacred to the Druids, and the winter fruit of the mistletoe was a symbol of life in the dark winter months. By the way, a, a little FYI, uh, while mistletoe can successfully grow on more than 100 different types of trees, it is most often found on pecan, hickory, red maple, black gum, and yes, oak trees. I think that's probably a $500 question on Jeopardy that you just learned. <laughs> well, it was also the Druids who continued the tradition in Europe of the Yule log. The Celts thought that the sun stood still for, you guessed it, 12 days in the middle of winter. And during this time, a log was lit to conquer the darkness, banish evil spirits, and bring luck for the coming year. And note, the Druid celebration was another 12-day event denoting the complete annual cycle from solstice to solstice. So only the Roman Saturnalia had that number, magical number seven, the good luck seven. Almost all the other festivals that we're talking about have some concept of 12 in them. Okay, we've spent a lot of time in the Northern uh, Hemisphere, uh, and uh, 
getting a little cold outside, isn't it? So why don't we head south? And we're going to celebrate Inti Raimi. The Incan Empire was at its height between 1400 and 1500 in the Common Era. And it paid homage to the sun god Inti at a winter solstice celebration called Inti Raimi. In Peru, like the rest of the Southern Hemisphere, the winter solstice takes place in June. The Incas fasted for three days before the solstice. Before dawn on the day of the solstice, they went to a ceremonial plaza and waited for the sunrise. When it appeared, they crouched down before it, offering golden cups of a sacred beer made from fermented corn. Animals, uh, including llamas, were sacrificed during the ceremony, and the Incas used a mirror to focus the sun's rays and kindle a fire. After the conquest uh, by Spain of the Incan Empire in 1533, the Spaniards banned the Interrami holiday. But it was revived during the 20th century with mock sacrifices, not real ones. And uh, this, as you can tell from the pictures on your screen, is a festival that is continued today in the 21st century. Okay, let's head back up to the Northern Hemisphere. And this time we're gonna go to China. We're going back to the December holiday, the December 21st event. And it's Dong Zhi. The Chinese celebration of the winter solstice, which began in prehistoric times, welcomes the return of longer days and an increase in positive energy in the coming year. The celebration may have become as a harvest festival when farmers and fishermen took time off to celebrate with their families. <clears throat> During the reign of the Han Dynasty, that's about 200 BCE to 200 CE, the holiday grew in importance. It was also important during the later Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty, when the emperors officially prescribed it as a day to worship and sacrifice to their household gods and to their ancestors. Today, Dongxi remains an occasion for families to gather to celebrate the past year and to share good wishes for the year to come. Now, the most traditional food for this celebration in southern China are the glutinous rice bowls known as Tang Yuan, often brightly colored and cooked in sweet or savory broth. The northern Chinese enjoy plain or meat stuffed dumplings, a particularly warming and nourishing food in uh, the midwinter. Again, we have to remember that especially Northern China gets really bitter cold in the winter months. Now let's return to the Mid East uh, and this time to Iran, which was ancient Persia. Yalda night is an Iranian festival ce celebrating the longest and darkest night of the year. The celebration springs out of ancient Zoroastrian traditions and their customs, and it tended to be <clears throat> a night that would protect people from evil spirits. On Yalda, which or Shabe Yalda, which translates to night of birth, <clears throat> Iranians all over the world celebrate the triumph of the sun god Mithra over darkness. Now, according to tradition, people gathered to protect each other from evil, burn fires to light their way through the darkness, and perform charitable acts. Now, I'm just going to put this as an important footnote. You noted that I've, <clears throat> I'm talking about four specific holidays uh, in December, all of them centering around the solstice. Well, on this topic of Muslim countries, 
you may be wondering why I don't mention any Muslim feast days for December. Well, that's because Islam operates on a lunar calendar, which means specific important celebrations like Eid or Ramadan shift by about 11 days each year, meaning that celebrations like uh, the Eid al-Fitr generally occur about a week and a half earlier than they did the year before. So the calendar is shifting. So what might be in December this year uh, might be in you know October in a couple of years. So there's no specific winter holidays in Islam. There are holidays, but it's not just relegated to one specific time of the year. Meanwhile, back to solstice celebrations, how about North America and its indigenous peoples? On the left, we look to the Zuni, one of the Native American Pueblo peoples in Western New Mexico. For them, the winter solstice signifies the beginning of the year. It's marked with a ceremonial dance called Shalako. Now, in the center of the screen, that kind of main background picture, we see the Hopi in northern Arizona. They celebrate the winter solstice with Soyal, when the sun chief announces the setting of the sun on the solstice. An all-night ceremony then begins, including kindling fires, dancing, and sometimes even gift-giving. And if there is gift-giving, one of those gifts might be a kachina doll, as seen in the lower left, uh, here are these beautiful Kachina dolls. They're quite beautiful. Now, I had to be a little bit selfish here. I had to talk about the Pacific Northwest. That's where I live, right? For those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest, the Sayalks, uh, the Okanagan people of Washington State and British Columbia, celebrate the winter solstice with ceremonies that include prayers for the new year to come. There are also prayers for the so-called four chiefs. Uh, that's berries, roots, four-legged animals like deer, and fish. And finally, there are prayers for families. There are also songs, uh, winter dances, uh, feasting, and gift-giving. These events are held during the evening and can actually go all night. Some dance ceremonies, like those on your screen, the one to the left, from an archival photo in 1890, and the oh, excuse me, that's on the right, the one on your left, which is a drawing of a contemporary festival. Well, some of these ceremonial dances not only go for the night of the solstice, but can continue on for 10 or 12 days in a row. 12 nights in a row. Uh, by the way, notice the magnificent Hamatsa masks depicting the monster bird known as Hakakwa. Um, and you can see it in the photograph down here on the left and in the drawing over here on the right. They're really quite magnificent. I've seen some of them here in our local museums and they're, they're really magnificent. You can see the length. They're almost the same size as the person. Quite something. Well, winter solstice over, let's move on to another great holiday festival, Hanukkah, which, uh, by the way, has several different spellings. All are right, none are wrong. Pick one. <laughs> in Hanukkah in America, Diane Ashton says on page 14, which is the introduction, Celebrating Hanukkah each year, Jews acknowledge boundaries between themselves and Christian society. But by touting Hanukkah's fit with the values of the Christmas season and of American culture, they insist on their right to be different because underneath, people are all the same. Moreover, by elaborating on their own religious festival that commemorates a miracle, Jews also refute secular trends in America that diminish religion's importance. So while it appears at first glance that Hanukkah elaborations are all about Jews fitting into America, 
Closer analysis suggests that Hanukkah is the vehicle through which Jews draw distinctions between themselves and the majority society while asserting their common humanity. Now, we're going to be revisiting this tension between wanting to be part of a society and wanting to be individuals within a prevailing majority when we look at Kwanzaa. But for now, let just again, bookmark this idea, this quote for later, and remember that what we say about today's celebration of Hanukkah is primarily a very American thing. Well, in a nutshell, here's the Hanukkah story. In 200 BCE, King Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire took control of Judea, incorporating it into his kingdom. He was one of his was one of the empires that succeeded after the conquest of Alexander the Great. So when Alexander died, the kingdom was divided up. Antiochus became the king of one of those slices of the Alexandrian pie, as it were. Well, once he took control of Judea, he promised the Jews respect for their ancestral religion and customs. And he did. And the Jews lived peacefully under his imperial power for well over two decades. But, there's always a but, right? In 175 BCE, Antiochus' successor, King Antiochus IV, invaded Judea and began an all-out assault on Jewish culture and religion, trying to force his own Hellenistic, his Greek ways, his Greek culture on the Jews in the same way that he was trying to do that in other parts of his empire. Well, the Jews had had enough and they revolted under the leadership of the Maccabees. The name comes from the Hebrew word for hammer, and Hammer was the nickname of Judas Maccabeus, one of the early leaders of the revolt. By 165 BCE, the Jews had defeated the Seleucid army and taken possession once again of that portion of Jerusalem where the temple was located. Of course, the temple, the central symbol to Jewish religion and culture. Now, before we describe the rest of the story of Hanukkah, I'd like to look at a few definitions. They're going to be important for the rest of this program. Three words, myths. Myths are a way of explaining the unexplainable. They're uh, an early form of science that generally originates in the upper or priestly class, you know. How did the sun come to be? Why are there clouds in the sky? Well, you create a story, a myth that would explain it. So in that sense, it's early and putting in air quotes science. Now, almost always classical myths began as oral stories. In other words, they weren't originally written down. Well, underneath the word myths, you see folklore and fairy tales. They, they originate with the common class. They are meant to be instructional, instructional, moral, or entertaining. And they too often begin with oral tellings before they're written down at a later date. And of course, a classic example would be Aesop's fables, you know, which usually ends with that famous line, and the moral of our story is. And finally, and for our purposes, for the rest of this program, the really important word is legends. Legends are stories based in some part on actual history, but usually exaggerated for effect and importance. And like myths and folktales, legends are usually told first orally and then written down later. Um, a great example would be um, <clears throat> the Trojan War. For many years, people thought it was a myth. Heinrich Schleiman discovers in the mid-19th century the ruins of Troy, and all of a sudden it gets upgraded to legend because we found that there is a historical basis for the legend of Troy, for the there's history for Troy, there was a Trojan War, but the exaggerated part for effect might be something like the Trojan horse, uh, where 24 Greek soldiers inside the belly of a wooden gifted horse suddenly is able to defeat the entire city. 
Okay, so using this basic paradigm, Hanukkah clearly is rooted very much in legend. Why? Because there is clearly an historic foundation. But certain elements, such as miracles, well, that might have both mythic and folklore roots. So Hanukkah is a Jewish legend, historically based story that does contain folkloric elements that's recounted in the Talmud, the apocryphal books of Maccabees 1 and 2. And here's some fun trivia. It's also told, uh, spoken about in the Gospel of John in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus, who was an observant Jew, is said to celebrate it in the 10th chapter of the book of John, uh, and he celebrates it in winter. Now, the Talmud and the books of the book of, of the Maccabees recount that upon their victory in 165 BCE, the Jews wanted to relight the sacred temple, uh, the lamp, I should say, in the temple that had been desecrated by Antiochus, but found only enough oil for one night. Miraculously, however, that little bit of oil lasted eight nights. This legend is the basis for celebrating Hanukkah, which translates as rededication, as in the rededication of the temple. And that's why Hanukkah is celebrated over eight days. Now, because the Torah, the five books of Moses, makes no mention of Hanukkah, for nearly 2,000 years, the Jewish religion placed much more importance on holidays such as Passover and Rosh Hashanah. Yet because Hanukkah usually occurs in December around Christmas time, as well as winter break when people of many religions are celebrating the season, Jews living in the United States in the early 20th century began placing more importance on the holiday. Well, now today, Jews around the world, even in Israel, have followed suit and Hanukkah is more important than it certainly once was, especially here in America, but now pretty much around the world. Now, Hanukkah has its own set of customary foods. To celebrate the holiday, Jews fry foods in oil to acknowledge that miracle of the oil. They may eat latkes, uh, sufganiyat, those are the jelly donuts, kugel, noodle or potato casserole, and they might even eat gelt, which are chocolate uh, coins. And we're going to talk more about gelt in a few minutes. But at Hanukkah, kids also play with dreidels, which are small spinning tops. Now, tradition says that before the Maccabees revolted, Jews, because of the edicts of that mean Antiochus IV, weren't legally allowed to read the Torah. So they would study the holy text while pretending to gamble with spinning dreidels. Now, this part of the story is a good example of a blending folkloric myth uh, elements with the historic legendary aspects of the uh, Hanukkah tradition. Antiochus is a real person in history, but the origin story of the dreidel, well, that may be rooted more in folklore. Well, regardless, um, a dreidel, it has four sides, and each of the four sides has a Hebrew character, nun, gemel, he, or shin. The four letters are said to stand for the Hebrew phrase, nes gadal chayam sham, uh, meaning a great miracle happened there, which refers to the miraculous eight-day long-lasting oil. Well, now let's get back to gelt. Gelt is both a Hebrew and a Yiddish word for money and closely related to the German word for gold or money. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Yiddish is an amalgam of Hebrew, Aramaic, and uh, basically medieval Germanic and Slavic dialects. It was spoken in Eastern Europe and throughout Russia and the Ukraine, eventually being brought here to America 
in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by millions of immigrants. Um, and the little side story here, of course, being a New Yorker, born and raised in Queens in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood, a lot of my older neighbors spoke Yiddish. That's where I picked up some expressions. Uh, and then when I would go into the city, um, this would be in the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, I was very aware that there was a very still, very thriving Yiddish theater, uh, especially down in the Lower East Side. Uh, and there were comedians like Molly Pecan and so forth um, who would uh, make wonderful jokes in Yiddish. Um, and of course, uh, I'm speaking now to a library in Somerset, New Jersey. Um, you're close enough to New York that you know uh, that New York has an extraordinarily large Jewish population. And a lot of Yiddish exp uh, expressions have crept their way into English. And now everybody uses things like, you know, you know, I'm schlepping my groceries and stuff like that. So traditionally, Jews everywhere, uh, but especially here in America, celebrated Hanukkah by giving their kids and relatives uh, money rather than wrapped gifts. But because holiday gift giving plays a big role for both Christians and secular people, many Jews in America and elsewhere now give and receive Hanukkah presents instead of money. However, to acknowledge the old tradition, many Jews also give children gelt in the form of chocolate coins wrapped in gold or silver foil, as you can see on your screen. As I said, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood in Queens, and uh, uh, I lived in a house. And our neighbors to the north and the south, oh, when it was Hanukkah time, uh, they would call me out. And over the fence, I'd get a little bag of gelt. And sometimes uh, uh, for, uh, you know, just because I was a good boy, uh, I, might, I might get some latkes. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, with the sour cream, of course. <laughs> So Hanukkah. Now let's move on from Hanukkah to a holiday that's usually around the same period, and that's to Christmas. And we're gonna do that with a photo that certainly idealizes the holiday experience. I mean, this is right out of a Hallmark movie, right? Uh, and here's a quote. You notice that I'm beginning each of these segments with a quote. Here's the quote to get us started. For the real subject of this book, and this is from Steve Nissenbaum's The Battle for Christmas. For the real subject of this book is not so much Christmas itself as what Christmas can tell us about broader historical questions. In writing about the commercialization of Christmas, for example, or the way Christmas made children the center of attention and affection, I have always tried to remember that those changes were expressions of the same forces that were transforming American culture as a whole. But it has been equally important for me to see Christmas as one of those very forces, as a cause as well as an effect, an instrument of change as well as an indicator and mirror of change. From that angle, Christmas itself played a role in bringing both the consumer revolution and the domestic revolution that created the modern family. In other words, as American culture changed, so did Christmas celebrations. Yet, Christmas celebrations in themselves became one of the causes for those changes in American culture, one fed off the other. Now let's go back here. In the early years of Christianity, Easter was the main holiday. Believe it or not, the birth of Jesus, Christmas, was not even celebrated until at least the early 300s. It was then in the 300s, in the fourth century of the Common Era, that church officials decided to institute the birth of Jesus as a holy day. Now, because the Bible doesn't mention an actual birth date or time of year, and only two of the four Gospels actually recounts the nativity of Jesus, but they don't mention any date. So because there isn't actually date or time of year, Pope Julius I 
who reigned from 337 until his death in 352, chose December 25th, most likely to adopt and absorb the traditions of the pagan Saturnalia festival of the Roman Empire, which still existed at that time. Remember, the fall of the Roman Empire doesn't happen until the mid-400s. So when Pope Julius in the mid-300s chooses December 25th, he is still operating the Catholic Church from within the Roman Empire, where the Saturnalia was an important holiday. And you may remember, I mentioned it, right? It's celebrated, uh, the last day of Saturnalia is December 24th, what we might call Christmas Eve. So Pope Julius says, okay, the next day, that's gonna be our festival. So first called the Feast of the Nativity, the custom spread to Egypt by 432, that's our earliest reference, and to England by definitely by uh, the mid sixth century, the 500s. By the end of the eighth century, the 700s, Christmas was celebrated in North Africa, the Mid East, portions of Russia, and through most of Europe. Indeed, by the late 700s, the celebration of Christmas had spread all the way up into Scandinavia. In addition, from medieval times to the present, all Christian denominations celebrate the Epiphany, or Three Kings Day, which comes, guess what, 12 days after Christmas, and that's on January the 6th. Hence, the concept of the 12 days of Christmas. On that day, that 12th day, January 6th, it is believed that three wise men finally found Jesus in the manger after a long journey from undetermined regions to the east of Nazareth. Interestingly enough, in many countries, this date, January 6th, that's the day gifts are exchanged, not on Christmas Day. And Epiphany makes sense. That's when the three kings bring the gifts to the baby Jesus, according to legend. So by holding Christmas at the same time as traditional winter solstice festivals and events in Rome like the Saturnalia, early church leaders increased the chances that Christmas would be popularly embraced, and therefore Christianity as a whole might be popularly embraced. Well, by the Middle Ages, believers attended religious services in church, but then celebrated raucously in drunken carnival-like atmosphere, not unlike today's Mardi Gras. It's, it's definitely a holdover from pagan festivals and the Saturnalia. Each Christmas in medieval Europe, just as it had been done during solstice festivals in ancient Greece, Rome, and Persia, a beggar or a student would be crowned the Lord of Misrule, and eager celebrants played the part of his subjects. The poor would go to the houses of the rich and demand their best food and drink. If owners failed to comply, their visitors would most likely terrorize them with mischief. As a result, Christmas became the time of year when those quote-unquote terrorized upper classes could repay their real or imagined debt by entertaining less fortunate citizens. Well, in the early 17th century, a wave of religious reform changed the way Christmas was celebrated in Europe. In England, for example, when Oliver Cromwell and his Puritan forces took over England in 1645, uh, they vowed to rid England of decadence, and as part of their effort, they canceled Christmas. The nerve. The pilgrims, who were separatists from the Church of England, came to America in 1620, and their beliefs were even more orthodox than those of Cromwell, and as a result, Christmas was not a holiday in much of early America, especially in New England. In fact, from 1659 to 1681, the celebration of Christmas was actually outlawed in Boston. And I love this little factoid that I researched and discovered. Anyone exhibiting the Christmas spirit in Boston was fined five shillings. 
I love it. By the late 18th century, a further blow came after the American Revolution when English customs like Christmas fell out of favor. But by the time we get to the early 19th century, the early 1800s, things had simmered down a little bit, okay? Rioting by the disenchanted classes often occurred during Christmas celebrations. In fact, and here's a wonderful piece of trivia, in 1828, the New York City Council instituted the city's first police force in response to a Christmas riot. That's got to be at least 600 on Jeopardy. <laughs> this mayhem catalyzed certain members of the upper class to begin to change the way Christmas was celebrated in America. Americans began to embrace Christmas as a family-centered day of peace and nostalgia. And part of the impetus for that change happened when, in 1819, Washington Irving, the great American writer Washington Irving, published the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crabb. This anthology includes a series of stories about a fictional celebration of Christmas in an equally fictional English manor house. And the sketches feature a squire who has invited the peasants into his home for the holiday. So what Irving was doing, right? He, he was showing that in contrast to the problems faced in American society, the two groups in that fictional manor house mingled effortlessly in peaceful, warm-hearted holiday spirit that crossed the lines of wealth and social status. Well, despite its in historical inaccuracies, the Christmas stories of Irving almost single-handedly changed perceptions about Christmas in America. Simply put, Irving invented fictional traditions that soon became rooted in the American uh, psyche. And what Irving had started in American literature, well, Charles Dickens reinforced and amplified in England when he published A Christmas Carol in 1843. That story's message, the importance of charity and goodwill towards all humankind, struck a powerful chord in England and America and showed members of Victorian society on both sides of the pond the benefits of celebrating the holiday. Christmas provided families with a day when they could lavish attention and gifts on their children without appearing to spoil them. Americans began to embrace decorating trees, sending holiday cards, having feasts, uh, giving to charities, and gift giving as the true spirit of the season. But now, when we think of Christmas, in addition to all of what I've just said, hmm, most of us also think about the fellow in the red suit, the one and only Santa Claus. Well, the legend of Santa Claus can be traced back to a monk named Saint Nicholas, who was born in Turkey around 280 of the Common Era. The real life Saint Nicholas gave away his inherited wealth and traveled the countryside, helping the poor and sick, becoming known as the protector of children and sailors. I have more of the history of the actual St. Nicholas on my website, and uh, it's really a remarkable history. Now, St. Nicholas first entered American popular culture in the 1600s in colonial New Amsterdam, now New York, when Dutch families gathered to honor St. Nicholas, or Sinterklaas. Well, of course, Santa Claus comes out of that and draws its name from this uh, abbreviation uh, of uh, Sinterklaas. And then in 1822, Episcopal minister Clement Clark Moore created the iconic image of Santa when he wrote an account of a visit from St. Nicholas, more popularly known today by its first line, which was the night before Christmas. Well, after that, uh, the version of Santa Claus as a jolly man in red with a white beard and a sack of toys 
was immortalized in 1881 when political cartoonist Thomas Nast uh, drew on Moore's poem to create the image of old Saint Nick that we know today. And you can see that very first illustration in the upper left of your screen. In the 1930s, artist Hayden Sunblom finalized the Santa we know today with his iconic Coca-Cola ads. Uh, by the way, the red color of Santa's clothing comes from the bishop's robes worn by the original Saint Nicholas. So Santa Claus is a great example of a legend. In this case, a person who is absolutely rooted in history, but who's been, uh, I'll put it in air quotes, uh, uh, amplified through folklore. But well, let's end our discussion of Christmas with a couple of fun facts here. Each year, 30 to 35 million real Christmas trees are sold in the United States. Christmas was declared a federal holiday in the United States on June the 26th of 1870. The first eggnog, I love this one, the first eggnog made in the United States was consumed in Captain John Smith's 1607 Jamestown settlement. Poinsettia plants are named after Joel R. Poinsett, an American ambassador to Mexico, who brought the red and green plant from Mexico to America in 1828. The Salvation Army has been sending Santa Claus clad donation collectors into the streets since the 1890s. And did you know this? Rudolph, the most famous reindeer of all, was actually the product of Robert L. May's imagination in 1939. He was a copywriter for the Montgomery Ward department store chain, and he wrote his poem and illustrated it to uh, help attract customers to Montgomery Ward's department stores. And Montgomery Ward published it, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. And uh, for those of us who have our roots uh, in the Northeast, of course, Christmas, right? The Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Well, construction workers started that Rockefeller Center Christmas tree tradition in 1931 when the center was being built. And on your screen, on your left, not quite the same as it looks today, that is the very first Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Well, last but not least, uh, in our celebration of uh, December holidays, winter holidays, we have Kwanzaa. Now, to fully understand the quote, and again, I have another quote to get us started. Well, to fully understand the quote from Keith May's book, we need to remind ourselves of this famous passage spoken by Frederick Douglass on July the 4th of 1852. Douglas said, what have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You rejoice. I must mourn. Now, with that in mind, we can better appreciate the quote from Keith Mays much better, I think. He says, indeed, the entire Black holiday tradition can be seen as an alternative tradition to mainstream American observances. But some Black holidays rooted in the 19th century have been more about Black incorporation into the mainstream American calendar and bringing African Americans as a people into the fold of American citizenship. Other Black holidays have sought to move African Americans away from mainstream holiday observances. If that Black freedom struggle has exhibited this propensity, often 
oft times wanting to be in, sometimes desiring to be out, then the Black holiday tradition, at least in its Black power phase, was no different. To speak of a Black power, excuse me, a Black protest calendar is not only to acknowledge and take seriously what Frederick Douglass had to say about American mainstream holidays, but to understand deeply how African Americans use the calendar to perennialize their struggle and annually politicize themselves into existence. Of course, what May says about Kwanzaa is reminiscent of what we heard Ashton say earlier in this program about Hanukkah in America, isn't it? On the one hand, you have a group of people, a minority, uh, in a predominantly white or certainly European and Christian culture who want a seat at the table. But on the other, you have that some that same minority wanting to assert its uniqueness, to celebrate its own strength, to remind the majority um, of Christian Americans that they, the minority, are part of a diaspora that has often been rejected by the majority, even to the point of death. And this is why, though serious tensions have existed in other areas of their relationship, many Jews and Blacks find a kinship. The horrors of the Holocaust and 400 years of slavery are bonds, as are racism, bigotry, and anti-Semitism, to name just a few. Well, in light of the recent prominence of the Black Lives Matter movement, Kwanzaa has taken on even more significance and importance. Dr. Molana Karegna, now 82 years young, is currently chair of the Department of African Studies at California State University in Long Beach. He created Kwanzaa in 1966 during the aftermath of the Watts riots in Los Angeles as a specifically African-American holiday. So, unlike the other holidays we've explored today, this holiday was created and is contemporary, as well as spiritual rather than specifically religious. Karegna's goal was to give Blacks an alternative to the existing holidays and give Blacks an opportunity to celebrate themselves and their history rather than simply imitate the practice of the dominant society. For Karegna, a major figure in the Black power movement of the 1960s and 70s, the creation of such holidays also underscored the essential premise that you must have a cultural revolution before the violent revolution. The cultural revolution gives identity purpose, and direction. Well, clearly Dr. Karenga's reasoning for creating Kwanzaa becomes spotlighted by the events of the past several years. Kwanzaa is a celebration of African-American culture held from December 26th to January 1st, culminating in gift giving and a feast of faith called Karamu Ya Imani. Although Kwanzaa is primarily an African-American holiday, it has also come to be celebrated outside the United States, particularly in Caribbean and other countries where there are large numbers of descendants of Africans. The name Kwanzaa itself derives from the Swahili phrase, Mantunda Ya Kwanzaa, uh, meaning first fruits of the harvest. Kregna was inspired by the first fruit festivals of the Zulu tribes in South Africa. The holiday is spelled with an additional A so that there would be a symbolic seven letters. So it's Kwanzaa, K-W-A-N-Z-A, and another A, two A's at the end. Seven is a special number among many native African tribes. And so as a result, most aspects of Kwanzaa, including the very name, revolve around the number seven. And again, doesn't that set it apart from the other celebrations we've looked at um, with different numbers, uh, eight for Hanukkah uh, and 12 for solstice and the Christmas celebrations. 
Kwanzaa celebrates what Dr. Kranga and other historians, sociologists, and anthropologists see as the seven principles of African heritage. Each of the seven days of Kwanzaa is dedicated to one of the following principles. And you can see them across the bottom of your screen. Let's start over on the left. Omoja, uh, unity, to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Kujigula, self-determination, to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. Ojima, collective work and responsibility to build and maintain our community together and make our brothers and sisters problems, our problems and solve them together. Here we have four, five and six. O again, starting from the left. Ojama, cooperative economics to build and maintain our own stores, shops and other businesses and to profit from them together. Nia, purpose to make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness. And over on the right, uh, Kumba, creativity, to always do as much as we can in the way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. And finally, there's number seven, Imani, faith, to believe with all our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Now, Kwanzaa also has seven core symbols. We have mezal, crops. Mezal symbolizes the fruits of collective planning and work and the resulting joy, sharing, unity, and thanksgiving, part of the African Harvest Festivals. To demonstrate Masal, people place nuts, fruits, and vegetables representing work on the Makeka. And that's number two. The Makeka is the placement. Just as the crops stand on the Makeka and uh, the present day stands on the past. The Makeka symbolizes the historical and traditional foundation for people to stand on and build their lives. Muhindi, the ear of corn. The stalk of corn represents fertility and the idea that through children, the future hopes of the family are brought to life. One ear of corn is placed on the mat for every child in the family. Mushuma Saba, the seven candles, well, just as during the eight days of Hanukkah and during the four weeks of the pre-Christian Advent season of Christianity, candles are an important aspect of Kwanzaa. The seven Kwanzaa candles are ceremonial objects that serve to symbolically recreate the sun's uh, power as well as to provide light. And there are three, there are three red candles three green candles and one black candle that are placed on the canara. And the canara is the candle holder. The canara represents our ancestry and the original stock from which we come. Kakomba Cha Omocha, the unity cup. On the sixth day of Kwanzaa, the libation ritual is performed to honor the ancestors. Every family member and guest will take a drink together as a sign of unity and remembrance. And finally, Sawadi, gifts. On the seventh day of Kwanzaa, the gifts are given, often during or after a feast, to encourage growth, achievement, and success. Handmade gifts are encouraged to promote self-determination, purpose, and creativity. So there you are, a little background about four holidays that are celebrated by untold millions of people in America and many millions more around the world. By unwrapping some of the history behind these celebrations, my hope is that 
we'll come to further appreciate the rich diversity that we find not only in America, but in the world around us. Again, for more information about today's program, please visit my website, makingwings.net, and take deeper dive number 50.